Well, this is week five in our series on the Lord's Prayer. And if you're familiar with the prayer or if you've been here for any of the previous sermons, you know that one of the things about the Lord's Prayer is that, that each thing you ask God for includes the implicit assumption that you are willing to be part of how God answers it. So for example, if you pray that God's name would be hallowed or honored as holy, then part of what you're praying is that, Lord, that I want to honor your name as holy. Or, or if you pray that, that God's kingdom will come and his will would be done, that means you're also including that I, I want to live in alignment with your kingdom. I want to obey what you've revealed to me about your will. So that's implicit in most of the prayer, but there's only one part of the prayer that's explicit about how we participate in God's answer to our prayers, and it's what we're looking at today. It's also the only request that Jesus comes back to at the end of the prayer and gives a kind of an explanatory footnote to make sure you understand exactly what he's saying. So today, we're going to read not just through the end of the Lord's Prayer, but the two verses after in verse 15. And if you're able to stand, I would invite you as I read it. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Jesus says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and here it is, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." That's the end of the prayer. Here's the explanation. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the good word of our good God. Give us life according to your word. You may have a seat. This is a hard one today, Uh, a demanding one, and yet one that I believe is the key to the health of your and my relationships and the key to the vitality of Christian faith. I'm going to take you on uh, what might seem like a journey down for a while with, with two really simple points. They're two distinctions. The first distinction is the distinction between debts and trespasses. And the second one is the distinction between forgiveness and restoration. And when we walk through those, we're going to use them to understand, apply the text, and then we'll close. So two distinctions. First, debts versus trespasses. If you've ever been in an unfamiliar church, say, or a wedding or a funeral, and there's that moment when somebody stands up and says, and now let us pray the Lord's Prayer together, you know the awkwardness that is coming, right? Because right there in the middle, there's going to be some people that go, forgive us our debts, and other people that go, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it just gets, the cadence goes off, and it all bleeds together, and you just like, by the time you get to the end, you're like, we made it. You know that feeling? Maybe you wonder, like, well, what's, what's the difference? Why do different traditions say different words? I mean, growing up, I used to think, well, you know, maybe Presbyterians are more likely to owe people money, and... <laughs> Like Methodists and Episcopalians are more likely to have property they don't want people trespassing on. I, you know, turns out that's not it. Um, and actually, what we just read explained it for us. So, verse twelve, in the middle of the prayer, Jesus says, "Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors." And then, verse fourteen to fifteen, when he kind of explains this forgiveness thing, he says, "Trespasses. We should forgive others their trespasses as God forgives ours." So debts and trespasses are very obviously, they're, they're synonyms. They're two different ways of talking about the same thing, which is just sin. In fact, if you look at Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11, that's just what Luke, how Luke renders it. Forgive us our sins. Mystery solved. But I would argue that, that Jesus is deliberate in using these two different words. The nuances are really important. So first of all, trespasses. Trespass is a, it's a legal term, and it just literally means to, to cross over a line. Now, the word transgress, it means the exact same thing. 
It means to cross over a line. When you trespass, you are, you're breaking a rule, you're breaking a law, you're, you're breaking a standard. And, and this is the most common way that people think about sin, right? It's, it's breaking a law. Debt, on the other hand, that sounds to us like, well, that's not a legal term, that's more of an accounting term, right? That's about dollars and cents. But actually, in the original languages here, this language of debt is a much more relational term. It's about the cost of restoring relationship and the reality of what sin does to break relationships and damage them. So here's the idea. Debts and trespasses teach us that the idea of sin, it's both breaking a rule and damaging a relationship. Two different sides of the same thing. Now, here's why I think it's really important for us to understand that both of those things work their way into the understanding of sin. Because if you're a Christian, what it means is that you have a wise and generous father who has a right to tell you what to do. Not just because he's the boss, he's the king of all things, but because he made you and he loves you. And he knows what's best for you. And he only asks you to do what he knows is good for you. That's the the basic premise of a God who calls us not to trespass, not to cross over or break his laws. Now, the reason I think that's important is because very often we walk through life with a cloud of guilt hanging over our heads. And that guilt very often does not come from God, from breaking God's laws, but from breaking somebody else's expectations. Very often they come from our families, from our, our friend groups. Uh, you know, you have, to, you have to weigh a certain amount. You have to look a certain way. You have to get married by a certain age or have kids by a certain age. They're, you have to be as successful as this person over here. We live under a giant weight of expectations. And we remind ourselves that sin is actually trespassing God's law. We're saying, and not yours, and not yours. It's only him that we are accountable to. There's a, you guys may be aware, we, we offer this course on a regular basis called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And, and the guy that put it together, Pete Scazzaro, he talks about expectations. He says, in order for an expectation to, va- to be valid, it has to fulfill four criteria. It has to be conscious, realistic, spoken, and agreed upon. Use that test for the things that are crushing you right now. Is it realistic? Did I agree to this? Or did somebody else just voice this on me? Reminding ourselves that that God is the one we're accountable to. This is kind of the first way of relieving ourselves of what is very often false guilt. However, if we only think of sin in terms of kind of breaking rules that God has set for us, there's also a danger on that side as well. There's the danger of forgetting the relational side. We remember the rules but we forget the ruler, especially when sin feels really good. And this is one thing I think as a kid, I I always had this, uh, I felt like people in church were always telling me like, sin is bad and it feels bad. Let me just go ahead and break it to you. Sin is bad, but it often feels great. And that's why we do it, right? And so there are these moments where you're like, well, there's a rule out there that says I shouldn't do it, but it feels awesome, so why wouldn't I? This is how Debt reminds us, no, actually, when, when we break a rule given to us by a loving father, we're breaking the relationship, we're, we're breaching the trust, we're damaging something that needs to be healed. We need to keep the rules and the ruler together. But, but not only that, not only do we need to keep the debts and trespasses, but we need to understand that he's not only our ruler, but he's our redeemer. To the heart of the Christian faith The gospel, the good news, is that the same God that we owe this unpayable debt to is also the same God who, in the person of Jesus, pays that debt for us. And this is the heart of the message of Christian faith. If you don't even believe it, you know it's like Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And you're so familiar with that, you might have never asked the question, how does that work? Like, why, why death on a cross? Why does that release me? And I would actually argue that that the emotional logic of the cross makes more sense to you than you realize. See, because if you've ever been really hurt, like betrayed hurt, like scars on you that you will probably take to your grave hurt, you know that there's something in you that says, 
They don't just need to be sorry. I don't just need them to pay a fine. They should hurt too. Something deep inside us knows that suffering calls for suffering. Pain calls for pain. Blood calls for blood. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. Took the pain that somebody deserved to pay the debt that we couldn't. As a Canadian pastor named John Smed, he puts it this way, the brutality of the cross is a measure of the horror of human sin. It matches the punishment and the crime. And he didn't deserve it, but he put himself in that place so that we could be released. Sin is a horrible and a hideous debt, but only Jesus could pay it, and he did. Amen, anybody? That's good news. Amen? Yes. Here's why that's vital in our world today. We've always needed to know that forgiveness is available, that that God could cleanse us from all that is wrong with us. But I, I would argue that we especially need to know it now in the year 2022. I think we live in one of the most moralistic eras in human history. And here, here's what I mean by moralistic. I mean, if you log on to the internet or open up your phone or walk out the door, you are basically walking into a hailstorm of expectations of who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to know and what you're supposed to do. And if you don't feel it yet, just keep that in your mind and look for it this afternoon, Monday morning, this week. It's everywhere around us. You know, a few years ago, people started to become much more common for people to use the phrase, silence is complicity. You know, on any number of particular uh, public issues, if you're not saying something, you're complicit in the problem. And th- there is a real dynamic there. There are situations where silence can be a way of perpetuating an injustice. But something I've noticed recently is that language has been even escalated. Silence is violence. And, and it's just slung out at anybody. It's like, if you're not saying something, you are doing violence to people. Do you feel that pressure in your life? All of the knowledge that we have, all of the, the, the news and the access that we have, we know what we're doing to the planet. We know where the injustices are. We know who's poor and needs more help. All of the expectations are just crushing us. We need to know There is only one that we owe a debt to, and there is only one who has already paid it. Amen? Let me just drive this a little little deeper. um, There's an article that I read five years ago by a scholar named Wilfred McClay called The Strange Persistence of Guilt. And the thesis of the article was that if you you read a lot of social scientists over the past few hundred years, they've basically been arguing that once we can get past religion and all the guilt that religion puts on people, we're going to kind of enter this new era of history where we just do what we want and everything is awesome. And McClay's like, why is that not happening? Why is it actually going in the other direction, where where we actually feel more guilt, more burden than ever before? And he said, it's basically this, we're we're no longer looking at God to tell us what we're really called to do, we're looking at everybody else. But worse, we don't have anything to do with our guilt, If you don't believe in a savior who is crucified and resurrected from you, who can cleanse you of your guilt once and for all, you're stuck with it. And the only way that you could possibly feel clean, the only way that you can possibly feel righteous is to identify some way that somebody else has hurt you. Because if I'm the victim, by definition, I'm right and you're wrong. And if you can't find a way that somebody else has hurt you, you got to get as close to other people who are victims as possible and champion them and fight for them. That's the only righteousness anybody has left. And now look, let me be really clear. There is such a thing as victims. Uh, that's, that's obvious. I mean, Jesus is assuming that in this passage. And, and it is righteous to defend and work for justice. But if that's the place we are getting our righteousness, we are just descending into a cesspool of pointing fingers and guilty burdens, and that is not the good news of Jesus. We need this so much more than we think. We have debts that are trespasses. We have a redeemer who has unburdened us of them. And and that leads us to the second key distinction The second key distinction is the distinction between forgiveness and restoration. 
Uh, You might have heard a similar distinction, forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, That's another fair word. I think restoration highlights a little more. These are, in this case, these are not two different ways of talking about the same thing, but they are related. So let's let's start with forgiveness. Uh, The word in, in the original text here for forgiveness, it simply means to leave, to release, to let go. Simple definition of forgiveness is to release your right to make the person who sinned against you pay. Forgiveness is simply releasing your right to make the person who sinned against you pay. And that feels like, okay, that's something that happens inside me. Uh, how, what does that look like practically? Let, let, me, let me work it out for you. So um, Reverend Dr. Tim Lane has preached for us a number of times. He's gonna preach for us next month. He says it involves three specific commitments. Number one, I won't keep bringing it up to you to hurt you. Number two, I won't keep bringing it up to other people to hurt your reputation. Number three, I won't keep bringing it up to myself to nurse my own sense of hurt or rightness. Whoa. That's hard to do, right? Especially when you're really, really hurt. And this is not an isolated teaching of Jesus. This is not something that he just happened to drop into the Lord's Prayer and we move right along. No, he said this kind of thing all the time. In Luke chapter 17, he says, if your brother sins against you seven times in a day and he turns and repents each time, you must forgive. In Matthew 18, Jesus went even further. He told Peter he should forgive his brother 77 times, or seven times 70 Jesus is asking us, when he says forgive, he is setting an incredibly high bar. Okay, if that's, if that's forgiveness, well, then what is, what is restoration? Restoration is actually a longer process. Restoration takes forgiveness to its hoped-for end. It says, not only will I release you from my right to make you pay for what you did, restoration says, I will work with you to rebuild trust. I'll work with you to rebuild trust so that, Lord willing, our relationship can be restored and healed to its former strength, if not sometimes stronger. The process of restoration, I like to use this metaphor, sometimes is like a broken bone that once it's set, after the bone has healed, it's actually stronger at that, bo- at that broken place than it was before. That's the goal of restoration. But the reality is, is while, while forgiveness is, is something that's, that's relatively discreet, you can make commitments, those three commitments, restoration can take a long, long time, and there are lots of ways that it may never happen. You can imagine some of the easy reasons why. I mean, first of all, either person can refuse to try. It takes two to make it work. One, one person can cut off communication altogether. One person can die. And forgiveness is possible, but not restoration, Even if one person has worked really hard to try to re-earn trust, the other person may still refuse to grant it. And then there's also the reality that you can forgive someone, but the consequences of that forgiveness can't be erased. If you you break the law and and you're caught, you still may need to go to jail even if you are forgiven. In, In short, Forgiveness is something that's always accessible to us. And Jesus is saying it's non-negotiable. Restoration may or may not happen. It's a goal that requires more than one person to achieve. Now, here's why I think this is so important for us to to grasp this distinction. Very often, one of the reasons why we hold on and don't want to forgive somebody is because we confuse it with restoration. We think, if I forgive you, then I've just got to pretend like everything's fine. And we've just got to go right back to that place we were before this happened, and I'm just going to have to put myself in that position to get hurt by you all over again, and I I just can't do that. That's not forgiveness. That's restoration. That's a process. We confuse those two processes. If you're a Christian, I think you need to forgive, and you need to want to and be willing to work for restoration if the person proves trustworthy, but it might actually be unloving 
to restore trust too soon. Let me give you an example of what that could look like. So imagine, let's say, you keep a little stash of, of cash, a little pocket money in your sock drawer at home. And a member of your family, struggling with an addiction, finds your little stash of cash, spends the money on some substance, and, and eventually you, you catch them and you find out what they did and they, they admit it, they confess to you, the, the forgiveness is granted, do you keep putting money in your sock drawer? No. It's, in fact, it's unloving to, to put them in a position where it makes it easy for them to sin against you, to sin against God, and to sin against themselves in that same way. See, trust has to be re-earned. Maybe over time, as certain behaviors are demonstrated, you may put the money back in your sock drawer. Forgiveness and restoration, it is one of the the most helpful, important principles to understand that difference between the two. Now, now that we understand them, let's go back to what Jesus told us in the prayer and see if this can help us make sense of it. So what did he say, first of all? We should pray in verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Some, some translations, some ways you've said it will say, forgive us our debts as we forgive them, right? I think the past tense is a much more faithful rendering of the original language. Forgive us as we've already forgiven. And if we didn't pick up on that little hint, he comes back, verses 14 and 15. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, your Father will not forgive your trespasses. Sometimes you have to just sit with the Bible for a second when it says something that sounds outrageous. And ask yourself, what are you really saying, Jesus? It sounds like he's saying only forgiven people or forgiving people get forgiven. And and if you read a a dozen commentaries, all the scholars, any any scholars worth their salt at least, are going to be quick to say that that can't be what he means. No one can earn God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness is is given to us freely, purely by grace. We've been singing about that already today. So, So the typical conclusion is that's not really what Jesus meant. What Jesus meant to say was something like this, that by forgiving other people, we demonstrate that we have been forgiven by God. It's a sort of an outworking or a, or a proving of the forgiveness that we've already received. Now, that's something that the Bible does teach very explicitly. The Apostle Paul says it in Colossians 2, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. See the, the sequence. Same thing in Ephesians 4. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So it's absolutely true and absolutely beautiful. But here's what's been bugging me all week. Why didn't Jesus say it that way? Why did he say it this way? And assuming as the incarnate son of God, he knew why he said it that way. I think the distinction between forgiveness and restoration makes sense out of it. See if you can follow me. See, the Bible is is crystal clear that if you have put your faith in Christ, you are fully, completely, permanently forgiven. Cling to some of these verses. Romans 8, chapter 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation, The old has gone, the new has come. Or as Jesus himself said it on the cross, it is finished. There's nothing else you can do for God to forgive you more than he already has. It's complete, it's permanent. He did it once and for all. Your salvation is secure. The Holy Spirit has taken a permanent residence in your heart. He will never leave you, he will never forsake you, and when your body dies, you will be with him forever until you're till he returns and your body is resurrected with him to live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. That is guaranteed for all who belong to Jesus. Thank you, June. Amen. But as long as sin still lives in us on this side of eternity and it lives in me, the quality of our relationship with God, the freedom And the trust and the confidence in our relationship with him, that can be damaged. And that's what I think he is talking about 
here. For example, let's say someone has gossiped about you. This has happened to all of us at some point, I'm sure. You, you hear it, it makes, the gossip makes its way around back to you. Somebody said something just really unkind or unflattering about you, and that person has done it before, and you are done with them. You want nothing to do with them, and you might have to make sure that some other people want nothing to do with them either, which is also gossip, just a side note. So, so that's where you are. That week when you're feeling that, you happen to go out with friends, you find yourself drinking too much. You drink so much, you get sloppy, you say things you shouldn't have said, you do things you shouldn't have done, you wake up with a hangover and regret. And you know that you've sinned not only against your own body, but you've sinned against God. And so you get on your knees to the Lord and you say, Lord, I, I, that, was, that was foolish, that was wrong. Will you forgive me? Based on this passage, I, I believe Jesus is saying God's answer at that point is no. Or more accurately, not yet. I think what God would say is, you have business to do with your brother or sister before my relationship with you can be restored to its full freedom. If this sounds like Walter's crazy interpretation of the Lord's Prayer, back up two chapters in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your altar there, your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or your sister and then come and offer your gift. That's when they have something against you, not even that you did something to them. And he says, horizontal reconciliation. That starts first, then come to me. It's a demanding standard. And, and it almost sounds impossible, and it's easy to get into thinking, Jesus, are you, are you saying that only forgiving people get forgiven? No. You are already forgiven. In, if your faith is in Christ, that's permanent, that's real. I think what he's suggesting is that this thing that sounds so hard, because nobody wants to do this, may actually be the gateway to joy. You know, uh, anybody, if, you've, if you've followed God for any length of time, you've gone through seasons of life where your faith just feels stale. And you show up in church, and people are singing the songs, and they look like they mean them, and you're like, how do you mean this? It just feels flat to me. Or you can read the Bible for weeks or months, and you're reading these words that once made your heart leap, and you're like, it's just stale. What if one of the reasons why God's grace is not amazing to you is because the amazingness of his grace is not flowing from you to other people? Horizontal and vertical. We only get it from him. You wouldn't have it to give if he didn't give it to you. But you're tasting and experiencing and delighting and reveling in the freedom of his grace. That can be clogged by refusing to forgive others. You know, there's a, there's a common expression people use. You've, you've probably heard it. You know, forgiveness is like drinking poison and, and hoping that the other person will die. And... Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. Bitterness can just eat you alive, but, but the biblical logic is, is not, hey, that unforgiveness is hurting you. It's hurting everybody. It's hurting the heart of the Lord. It's hurting the people you love. The point is, you've got to receive grace from the Lord. The point is, keep it in circulation. Be forgiven. Extend forgiveness. Be forgiven, extend forgiveness. Be forgiven, extend forgiveness. That's the rhythm of the gospel. How can you do that? How, how can you practically uh, make that happen in your life? Well, let me just remind you that the Lord's Prayer, remember, we don't just use it and, and memorize it so that when, when it comes up in church, we'll know the words. It's, it's a model, it's a pattern. It's telling us these are the things that should be part of our everyday praying in our own words. And what I would suggest is that if you're a Christian, every prayer doesn't have to hit all the points of the Lord's Prayer, but one of them should. And when you get down on your knees and pray to the Lord, 
always somewhere in the mix should be, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me my debts. Help me to forgive my debtors. Let me mention three specific ways that I, I practice that personally. Uh, these, are, these may not work for you. This is not a law, so this is not an assignment. But just if you want an idea, I keep three lists. First list. This is going to sound morbid. It's a list of sins. And it's not just a, a garden variety list of sins, like seven deadly ones. It's a list of, of my sins, of, of my characteristic issues, of the things that as long as I know my own heart, they tend to plague me and come back and recur in my life. And it's, it's a long list. And I open it up when I'm praying. And sometimes I look at it and I was like, yeah, you know, that one, God's growing me in that one, and I just keep moving. And other ones, I was like, oh, that one. Yep, yesterday. Ooh, that one, five minutes ago, right? And, and as I hear these, these sins of, that I know are mine, there's initially, it sucks. You don't like it. You don't like to face those things. But you know what it does is it drives me to the cross of Jesus. And see, I don't have to just walk around with this weight of all these expectations and failures over my head. I can lay them down, and he can take them away, and they'll be gone. Amen? Amen. I keep a list of my sins so I can unburden my heart. It humbles me and it relieves me. I also keep, this is my second list, I keep a list of, of virtues, of, of qualities that I want my life to be characterized more by. Of boldness and generosity and patience and, and listening and kindness and sacrificial love, things like that. It's a, that's a long list too. And as I'm going through that list, two things happen to me. One is I get really excited because I start thinking about how I've seen those in other people. I see them in, in the character of Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I want to be that guy. And at the same time, I realize, oof, there's some other ways that I'm not that guy. See, sin is not just crossing over lines where we commit sins. It's also not crossing the lines that Jesus says that we should, sins of omission. And, and when we keep in front of us a standard of beauty and perfection, it's another way that leads us back to the cross. Beloved, if you find yourself coming to confession and you're like, Lord, forgive me for, I don't know, just working too hard, uh, let me suggest to you, you need a list like this. None of us is who we should be or could be. Here's a third list. I keep a list of specific people who have hurt me. And the reason I keep this list is not to wallow in self-pity or pray that God will smite them. I pray, first of all, that God will extract out of me the poison of bitterness and release me from its grip. And secondly, I pray that God will bless them beyond measure. And that's a hard turn to make, right? <laughs> it's praying that God will release me from this sucky feeling that I have. I can get there. Okay, that person that did that to me, I, I've got to pray that God will bless them. And uh, some of the people on my list have been on that list for years. And it has become a delight for some of them already to pray that God would be good to them, that he would be half as merciful to them as he has been to me. There's a German martyr from World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Lutheran pastor, beautiful book, Life Together. He said, I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me. You want to love people that, you want to, that your natural tendency is to hate, pray for them. One last bonus tip. If you're in a situation where you realize you need forgiveness from God, don't just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is a good thing to say. It's a statement of regret. Forgiveness is a question. Will you forgive me? Same thing when you need forgiveness from a person. Will you forgive me? And when somebody asks that of you, don't say, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. I forgive let me leave you with this. Famous scene from the ministry of Jesus, Luke chapter 7. 
Similar stories in all four Gospels, but this one is especially powerful. Jesus is invited to eat at the home of a Pharisee. And while he and this Pharisee and presumably other esteemed guests are eating, this notoriously sinful woman barges into the room, cracks open this expensive alabaster jar of expensive perfume, starts anointing Jesus' feet with this perfume, wetting his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. Think about the scene. Everybody knows who she is, what kind of person she is. Everybody can smell this aroma that's filling the room. Everybody can hear her sobbing. Think about how much you have to cry to get somebody's feet so wet that you can only dry them with your hair. We don't know what Jesus said to her. We don't know why she had this act toward him. But the Pharisee who hosted him is thinking to himself, if, if Jesus were really a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this was. And Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking. So he's like, look, from the minute I walked in here, you failed to love me in all the ways that she has. So let me tell you a little parable. Two different guys owed money. One of them 500 denarii, one of them 50 denarii. 10, 10 times more one than the other. The money lender forgives both debts. Which one, Jesus asks him, will love him more? Pharisee, it's a pretty easy question. It's like, oh, the one that forgave or got the bigger debt forgiven? Jesus says, right answer. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. It's a powerful story, but do not miss that one central point at the middle of it. The fruit of forgiveness is love. Not just unburdening yourself from guilt. Not just getting to be a better person. But love. And if you want more love for humanity, you got to learn forgiveness from the Lord. If you don't think that you have much that God needs to forgive you for? If the really bad sinners are those people over there that could really use the kind of religion that's turned you into such an upstanding person, your love will shrivel and shrink the size of a pebble. This is what's wrong with the church. We're bitter and we're angry and we're self-righteous because we do not taste the sweetness of the gospel. There's an old Methodist hymn that puts it this way. How, Lord, can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart that broods on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart? What's the alternative? You make a habit of confessing your sins to God. You make a habit of taking hold of his righteous white robe and wrapping it around yourself and laying those sins down. Your love becomes so wide and warm that it will fill every room you walk into, every classroom and field, every sidewalk and arena. People will smell it on your clothes. Forgiveness breeds love. So you'll be able to sing the last line of that hymn which goes like this. In blazing light, your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew, how trifling others' debts to us, how great our debt to you. If you want that kind of love, only the cross of Jesus can give it to you, only the spirit of Jesus can give it to you. And he's holding out his arms and saying, take it. Will you take more of it today, beloved? Let's ask him to give us more. Pray with me. Our Father, our love is small. Would you teach us to forgive that it might grow wide and warm for you, for other sinners just like us. In Jesus' name.